Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Welcome to my review of Tom Bauer's Revenge. Life on the D-List, part one. Hollywood, a town of competition rather than compassion, was unforgiving towards Trevor and Megan. Any success would depend on a mixture of hard graft, genuine talent, and unexpected luck. At last, Megan got a break. Howie Mandel, a comedian and host of the TV show Deal or No Deal, watched her reel of one-liners and her audition. Her body and looks matched his requirements. She would be one of 26 identically dressed hostesses on 5-inch stiletto heels, squeezed into tight mini dresses to pronounce their figures, each carrying a briefcase. Starting at 5.30 a.m., Megan was contracted until after nightfall. Seven episodes were filmed in one day. Each show paid $800. Between each episode, she would change clothes. It's so embarrassing, she told her father. It's exposure, he consoled her. If you're spotted, you'll get another part. It'll take time to get there. Thomas knew that to win stardom, Hollywood expected Megan to do anything. Humiliation was one of the prices of winning fame. But the thing is, I didn't remember Megan. When Megan, when the, when she, all the hoopla started, I yeah. remember $5, but I don't remember <laughs> Megan. So, Megan was on 34 episodes of season two, which had 70 episodes total. At $800 per show and seven episodes per taping, with a little extra time allotted for special extended episodes, she made $27,200 US dollars for five days of work. It's clear she left at some sort of mid-season break or reevaluation. It's not clear why, if she chose to do so or they found someone new. Considering there are no stories about her misbehaving on set and other girls stayed for multiple seasons, she probably chose to leave. Would you leave a job that paid $56,000 a year for 10 days of work? It's not like she was being offered auditions for Walk the Line, The Queen, or La Vie en Rose anyway. And even if she was, 10 days of work wouldn't stop her from scheduling them. I'd also like to point out that Harry need not have gone more than two suitcases down to find an actually appropriate bride. Briefcase number 22 was the only Brit on the show, Laura Shields. She's half British, half Sri Lankan, a member of Mensa, has an IQ of 158, a master's in chemical engineering from Leeds University. Furthermore, she has actual manners and tact. When asked about Megan, she told the Daily Mail, Megan was sweet and quiet. Everyone I met on the show was nice. I wish I had some better stories for you. End quote. <laughs> All of my videos thus far have been about exposing Megan, but having no taste is 100% a Harry problem. Layla Milani, one of the other girls, would assert that Megan never went out after the shows, but read scripts for auditions. Those recollections were contradicted by Brett Ratner, a successful Hollywood producer at the time. Ratner prided himself that Hillhaven Lodge, his Hollywood palace, famous as Ingrid Bergman's first home in America, was in those years the center of the universe. Proudly telling everyone, I'm fat and Jewish, Ratner had dated tennis champion Serena Williams for two years. Several times every week, Ratner hosted all-night parties for the stars. Johnny Depp, Leonardo DiCaprio, Penelope Cruz, and many more swished into his hilltop compound. Tons of beautiful girls came, were called a close friend of Ratner. Among them every weekend were the game show girls, a dime a dozen was the common quip about party girls. Megan was one of those frequent guests. She was memorable to a few unusually observant guests as conservatively dressed and known to pose as an innocent. Yet, she was usually among the last to leave as dawn broke. Brett Ratner, ew. The man is notorious for being sleazy, telling girls he'll give them a role in exchange for sexual favors and then not even doing it. For those who might be unfamiliar, he was a legitimate Hollywood power broker, a director slash producer, most famous for Wonder Woman, the Rush Hour franchise, Mirror Mirror, Horrible Bosses, X-Men Last Stand, many, many more. He was one of the guys that went down during the Me Too movement and has not made a movie since 2017. He was publicly accused by six now famous actresses, including Natasha Henstridge and Olivia Munn, who weren't famous back then of offenses including forcing them to perform oral sex and vaginal rape. I don't have time to further expose Ratner here, but the original expose was in the LA Times, it was well-researched, fact-checked, and most damningly, 
not legally disputed by Ratner. Before that, his behavior was not even an open secret. It was just open. But it's not all ladies here. Obviously, today, if you look around, uh, Brett Ratner is here. Um, in his defense, he thought this was a thing where you could eat breakfast off of 100 women. So it's an honest mistake. He's famous for telling actors who want another take that rehearsal is for fags and will proudly tell any interviewer that Bob Evans, James Toback, Roman Polanski, and Woody Allen are or were his closest friends. He even made a sympathetic documentary on Woody Allen. Ratner's last stand was when Warner Brothers refused to work with him following Gal Gadot giving them an ultimatum that she would not play Wonder Woman again if he made a single dollar off of it. Gal Gadot, for those who don't know, is married to an Israeli billionaire. She likes Hollywood fame, but she doesn't need it. His behavior towards female actresses was always appalling, and it's wild to me that it took someone like Gadot to put her foot down, but here we are. I think this also explains why Serena Williams initially specifically denied that she was friends with Megan. Sam Kashner, the Vanity Fair reporter who interviewed Megan for her coming out puff piece, later said that when he called Serena for follow-up quotes, Serena said she was, quote, simply an acquaintance and gave her the message through the reporter, you've got to be who you are, Megan, you can't hide. At the time, it seemed cryptic. <laughs> I think now I understand exactly what she meant. First of all, Serena, ew for dating Brett Ratner, <laughs> but she was only 23, so I forgive her. That said, Serena, the goat, the girlfriend, only remembered Megan as one of the girls hanging by the pool, possibly trying to blow the right guy that she swished by on her way into the house. Serena only started calling Megan a friend after she landed Harry and started sending out those wedding invites. Watch out, Serena. I'm starting to think less of you, too. Keep going down this path and you'll get markled. By the end of the Deal or No Deal show, Megan had lost her coyness. Dressed in hot pants and little else, she starred in the lifestyle magazine at Men's Health making burgers on a grill. The champion of women's empowerment later described those experiences as being objectified. Life with Trevor was still good. They flew to Greece, Mexico, and Thailand to visit recommended restaurants. Although she barely earned enough to cover her own costs, Trevor's latest film scripts had earned him an income. The downside was that they still lived beyond the fringes of Hollywood's elite. Hollywood's power brokers were unaware they even existed. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I'll be doing a chapter a day to keep the corgis away. Toodaloo!